Welcome to the next session of the Science Writers 2020 Virtual Conference. I'm Alan Boyle, contributing editor at GeekWire and president of the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing. As CASW president, it's my honor to introduce the eighth annual Petrusky Lecture. The Petrusky Lecture was established in 2013 in honor of Ben Petrusky, CASW's longtime executive director and director of the New Horizons in Science program, which is part of Science Writers 2020. This lecture was conceived as a way for eminent figures to give big picture talks about their fields of research or to talk about important trends in science and society. Past Petrusky lecturers have included George M. Whitesides, Don Johansson, Joe Handelsman, Steven Weinberg, Susan Desmond Hellman, Shirley Tilgman, and Steve Squires. This year's Petrusky lecturer is Princeton University's Ruha Benjamin, who focuses on how emerging technologies can reinforce white supremacy and deepen social inequality, and what we all need to do about that. Dr. Benjamin is an Associate Professor of, American, of, of African American Studies at Princeton, founding director of the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab, and author of the award-winning book entitled Race After Technology, Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Code. She's the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships from organizations including the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Science Foundation, the Institute for Advanced Study, and Princeton, where she received the President's Award for Distinguished Teaching in 2017. I'm especially pleased that John Wiley and Sons, the distributor of Ruha's book, Race After Technology is supporting her lecture by donating free downloads of the ebook for attendees. And we have Sherry Hofer, Senior Vice President of Marketing at Wiley, on hand to accept our thanks for that. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Alan. And I'm honored to be here today. And at Wiley, we're excited to support CASW and to recognize Professor Benjamin not only for being a brilliant author and a wonderful role model for women in science and technology, but who is objectively pushing the research industry forward to strengthen the data-driven scientific knowledge that reflects all of the world's best thinking. You know, as publishers, we hold firmly to the idea that sharing evidence-based research that represents everyone is how we become stronger, better informed, more compassionate, and a more inclusive society. And now more than ever, we know, we know how important that mission is. We know that advancing knowledge and inspiring the exchange of ideas are essential to the human condition. And we are in a great moment of change and of challenge, which therefore brings great opportunity. So thanks again to all the journalists and the science writers for their role in educating the public about the importance of science. To Professor Jen Benjamin, thank you very much for your incredible impact. And to you, Alan, and to the entire CASW team, thank you for organizing this event. Very good. Thanks again, Sherry. Now, ever since we began presenting the Petrusky Lectures, one of our, our traditions has been to present the Petrusky Lecturer with a prism of appreciation. Well, for obvious reasons, we can't do that in person this year, but I'm happy to report that Dr. Benjamin has already received her Petrusky Prism and the accompanying certificate safe and sound. So here's an opportunity for her to show off the bling, receive <laughs> our virtual congratulations, and then launch us into this year's Petrusky Lecture. Thank you so much and congratulations, Ruha. Take it away. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and for Wiley for supporting this event um, with free ebooks. It's really my honor and my pleasure to be in conversation with all of you today. I can't think of anything better that I would want to do and spend my evening. And so I framed my remarks, um, 2020 vision, reimagining the default settings of technology and society. 
And as a sociologist, one of the ways that I think about my work is uh, providing conceptual tools for us to read our social reality with greater precision and accuracy. Before we can begin to write it, we have to, in some ways, read the patterns, understand the crises, what's led us to this moment of multiple crises. And so um, in my own work and my pedagogy, this is how I conceive of um, a building a toolkit, a conceptual toolkit that we can diagnose what's ailing us, ailing our body politic with um, greater accuracy so that we can do something about it. And so to begin, I wanna suggest that racism among other uh, axes of domination and difference really distorts our vision, whether as individuals, organizations, professions, in our quest to read reality. Um, if we're not reckoning with the deep-seated anti-Blackness and other forms of racism um, in intervening interpretive frames as we try to read reality, then we're likely to produce knowledge even that um, is not only not accurate, but harmful. And so there are countless examples of anti-Blackness to which we could point. Every headline, every hashtag brings a new, uh, bring us, brings us face to face with a new low, as it were. A few years ago, this particular image was leaked of the faces that Miami PD uses for target practice. And as you can see, you know, these are the faces of my brothers, my cousins, my uncles, my father. And if this is the, the, the image or the face which you're practicing on, um, then certainly when you begin to patrol the streets, you're primed to look for danger and threat and um, in, in these bodies, in, the, in these faces. And I think it's also worth noting as we excavate these instances of anti-Blackness and point to the, the, the icebergs underneath them, right? The long-standing patterns underneath any of these incidents. We also have to tell the stories of the people, the movements, um, the collectives that have resisted these forms of inequality and domination. In this particular case, um, when clergy in Miami found out and uh, found this, uh, were presented with this instance, they created a hashtag, use me instead. And they put their own faces there. Many of, majority of them were white clergy in the area. And so this is just one example of a long tradition of anti-racism of people, organizations, collectives, professions working to engender the kind of world in which we can all thrive. And so even as I'm gonna cast a light and shine a light onto the reality that really is um, pains us, that is about the harms and the viol everyday violence that people and communities face, I think it's imperative that we also um, use our intellectual tools in order to excavate and celebrate and build on this parallel history of anti-racism and um, those who seek equality. And so again, in terms of the distorting vision of racism, we have research uh, like this. Uh, some colleagues at Yale put eye tracking technology on preschool teachers and have them look at children playing, videos of children playing and, and prime them to look for the challenging behavior. And lo and behold, their attention consistently went to the little black boys in the play group, even though they were behaving the same way as all the other children. And so again, whether we're talking about the profiling of adults by police or the profiling of children by preschool teachers, this is a spectrum in which the, the periodic spectacle of violence that happens to hit the hashtag or the headline actually is built on the much more pervasive, much more everyday form of distorted vision that is anti-Blackness that permeates all of our institutions, whether education, whether housing or medicine or policing, um, it is really uh, the operating code, the operating program of our nation. And so no wonder when colleagues, uh, again, at, Ye at uh, Stanford this time, uh, conducted a study to see what it would do to the public's perception and their willingness to support reforms to the, um, the prison uh, system, if they presented them with statistics um, to show how 
much greater the rate of imprisonment is for Black Americans. They walked up to white Americans in coming off the BART in, in San Francisco, people walking on the sidewalk in New York City, showed them the data on the higher rates of incarceration of Black people, and then asked them, now that you see the disparities, the data that corresponds to the disparities, are you willing to support reforms to the three strikes law in California, to stop and frisk in New York. And the researchers were surprised to find that in fact, the more that people were exposed to the data, the less likely they were willing to support these policy reforms. In fact, they said using statistics to inform the public about racial disparities can backfire. Worse yet, it can cause some people to be more supportive of the policies that create those inequalities. And so here we, we are confronted with um, our own enlightenment thinking. That is data, knowledge, statistics should lead to an awareness that should lead to action. This kind of linear idea of the relationship between knowledge and change. And what we're confronted with through this study is that somewhere between people's perception, what's happening in their mind and the data there's, a, there's something happening in this intervening space. We might call it interpretive frameworks or conceptual lenses or stories that people tell and are told that help them make sense of what they're seeing. If they're seeing this high, these higher rates of black imprisonment, then for many of the people, individuals interviewed for this study, they seem to conclude that if there are more pe black people in our prisons, they deserve to be there. What did they do? Their, their interpretive frameworks do not entail racial profiling, do not entail criminalization, do not entail the history of policing and violence in this country. And so, again, I think for me, when I, I'm presented with this information, I, I think that the place that I end up is that we have to care as much about the stories that we're telling as we do the statistics. That is, if we just leave it to the numbers to speak for themselves, we're gonna be in for a, a, a real disappointment because stories, and that's why your own work is so vital, uh, really become the mediator for how people make sense of the world, including make sense of data. Of course, none of us wake up with this anti-Black lenses on, this distorting vision of race and racism. It has been constructed and construed over hundreds of years, and in fact, the role of science and scientists in constructing the architecture of race is essential for us to reckon with and sober us again in terms of the fields that we study and work in. Just one instance, of course, uh, of many I could point to is the renowned French naturalist Georges Cuvier, who wrote, the white race with oval face, straight hair and nose to which the civilized people of Europe belong and which appear to us the most beautiful of all is also superior to others by its genius, courage, and activity. The Negro is marked by black complexion, crisps of woolly hair, compressed cranium, and flat nose, which he then goes on to compare to the monkey tribe, the hordes of which consists have always remained in the most complete state of barbarism. It's a lot going on here. We could probably unpack it for the full hour, but I'm just gonna point to two things. One is to note that in the architecture of race, black and white are its poles, are its pillars. If we have to understand how the rest of humanity is organized into hierarchies, we have to take stock of the binary, the, the, the way that blackness is always pitted as the foil of whiteness. The second thing to note is the role of bodies in naturalizing racial hierarchies. It's not enough for Cuvier and his colleagues simply to say white people are superior, they have these great qualities, black people are inferior, they have these terrible qualities. This architecture needs to be mapped onto the body to naturalize it, to make it appear immutable, inherent, God-given because to the extent that we can think of racial differences as immutable and inherent, 
we're less likely to question it and thereby less likely to work to change it. And so as a first step in terms of the different stories that we need to tell about racism, we have to much more vigorously denaturalize these categories and these hierarchies that have been constructed over many, many years such that people walk around thinking that these differences are, um, are God-given and natural. The role of science, again, thinking about our present moment in terms of naturalizing violence, racial violence, um, is all around us. One instance we found with the autopsy report when George Floyd was murdered a few months ago. The first report, is, if you'll recall, was uh, it, it was framed in th these terms. The autopsy revealed physical findings uh, that the diagnosis of traumatic asphyxia or strangulation, Floyd had underlying health conditions, including coronary artery disease and hypertensive heart disease. In other words, his underlying conditions killed him, not the knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. This is a way, is a way not simply of naturalizing racial differences, but naturalizing racial violence. The role of physicians, the role of scientists using the, 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 the scientific speak, as we see here, um, legitimizes racial violence such that science has not simply been a bystander to racial violence, but has in many ways created the alibi. Of course, since this first report, the family hired its own independent report and we have a more honest reckoning what, which what killed Floyd. But it's important to note that colleagues of mine within the medical profession um, really confronted this as I think it needed to be confronted as much a part of a much longer tradition that they term structural gaslighting. There, th this is a way of thinking about how the real underlying causes in, in terms of the social conditions of our society, the anti-Black violence that permeates policing and other professions is to blame, not the underlying conditions of the individual. This, for, for if you wanna read more about this, um, check out the article in Scientific American. But the point here is to think about how Cuvier, Cuvier's legacy lives on in terms of the distorting lens of scientific sounding language and framings um, to justify racial violence, which brings us to the role of technology. So not just science and medicine, but technology, which again, I think we're socialized to think of as neutral and objective, standing above society in its own little bubble. And of course, in the last few years, that bubble has been burst. And so again, a simple exercise going to your Google images and typing in unprofessional hairstyles and you'll find images on your left. Professional hairstyles, you'll find images on your right. With some exceptions, of course, Beyonce is considered professional, the Hunger Games ladies unprofessional, but the larger pattern holds. That is that black women's natural hair is coded, literally coded, unprofessional, a la uncivilized, going back to Cuvier. And so in this case, our technology is mirroring back at us our associations, our racist associations, um, such that we have to, to decide now, what do we do with this, with this confrontation, with this mirroring? Will we excuse it? Will we uh, make excuses about why it persists? Or will we begin to confront it as some states have begun to do? In fact, California is considering a law called the Crown Act that um, addresses race-based hair discrimination because it is so pervasive. And so that is one instance of really um, a, a more thorough reckoning with this pattern that we see through a uh, simple exercise. And so to move forward then, I wanna suggest that we have to move beyond a techno-deterministic narrative about our relationship with technology. What is that? It's the assumption that technology is in the driver's seat, that we're either harmed or helped by new inventions, um, but the humans behind the scene are missing from the story. Whether it's the techno dystopian version on your left that Hollywood tries to sell us, technology, robots are gonna take all the jobs, they're gonna rob us of our human agency, or the techno utopian story on your right, the, the idea that um, automation and robots are gonna save us, they're gonna make things more efficient and more objective. Although these seem like opposing narratives, they share an underlying logic that we are either harmed or helped. But again, the people behind the screen are missing from view. And as it stands today, a very small sliver of humanity 
is currently doing the designing of our technological infrastructure of our digital worlds. And so my own vision, my own motivation is really to, to begin to think about what it's gonna look like and to demand a much more democratic participatory um, idea of who gets to have a say in terms of what's designed. And so moving beyond a techno deterministic rendering of our relationship, we have to address the power dynamics, the, the homogeneity of those who are currently comprising our tech workforce. And I say power, not simply ethics when it comes to technology, because it's a harder conversation and makes us more uncomfortable, but I think it's more precise um, when we think about what is the problem that we're confronted with when it comes to things like algorithmic discrimination or machine bias. And so when I think of power, I think of an, uh, uh, an experience I had some months ago when I was going to speak with students at Harvey Mudd College in Southern California, which some of you may know is a STEM oriented school. And um, as I was traveling there going through Newark International Airport, um, I was uh, heading towards my gate and passed by two men in the restaurant close to my gate. And I overheard one say to the other, I just want someone I can push around, dot, dot, dot. And you know, as a sociologist, I'm kind of always in field, mo field work mode. And so I made a mental note and thought to myself, wow, this sentence could end in so many different ways, couldn't it? It could be in the context of work, perhaps he was looking through resumes, thinking of someone he wanted to push around in that context or in the context of dating or marriage, perhaps he was going through his dating app, thinking about someone in that context. But the sentence could end in so many ways. And again, I, I was thinking about this as a, as a really crisp, clear articulation of a particular vision of what power is as a top-down formation, a power to lo lo lord over others, that my power requires someone else to be subordinate. But again, it's not the only mode of power. And so again, we have to think about what other forms of power can we imagine and engender that are more horizontal in form that don't require some people to be subordinate in order for us to feel good. So what does all of this have to do with technology and power? Well, as I said, I was going to speak with students. So I was thinking about this on the way uh, on my flight. And I, and I thought about this particular ad from a 1957 Mechanics Illustrated magazine. The robots are coming. When they do, you'll command a host of push button servants. It goes on to say, in 1863, Abe Lincoln freed the slaves. But by 1965, slavery will be back. We'll all have personal slaves again. Don't be alarmed. We mean robot slaves. Again, so much going on here. The same with Cuvier. We could talk about it for ages. I'm just gonna point out two, two things that relate most to the conversation. The first is just to point out the date, 1957, for us to think about what's happening in the social milieu in terms of domestic work, in terms of domestic labor. Who were the people dressing you, combing your hair, serving you meals in a jiffy? And were they being uh, beginning to push back such that you need a technological replacement? So that's a conversation in terms of the larger context, the social inputs, the desires, the anxieties that comprise the social uh, milieu and how that shapes the technological uh, investments at the time. The second thing to point out is we'll all have personal slaves again. With that one little word, it, it tells us who the imagined users or beneficiaries of these robot servants are. Certainly not those who are the descendants of people who were enslaved the first time. So with that one word, we see that interlocking systems of oppression and inequality converge. That the imagined user is raced, gendered, classed, without race, gender, or class ever being mentioned. And so when it, whether it comes to the inputs, the desires, the anxieties that's feeding this particular technological development or the outputs, who it's gonna circulate amongst, who the, who the market for this is. And on both ends of the technology, we're confronted with the fact that technology doesn't exist in a vacuum. And so in the same way that we would engage in this thought exercise for something in 1957, we certainly need to apply the same uh, analysis to the emerging technologies today, thinking about both the social inputs and impacts.
So with that, I'm gonna offer three main takeaways for the remainder of my um, presentation, just in case anyone has to log off early. Um, these are the three points that really hold all of the examples and um, concepts together. Um, and so the first idea is that racism is productive. It constructs, and I don't mean that, that productive in the normative sense, that it's literally good, but the idea that it produces things even as it wreaks havoc on others. Because still today, we're taught to think of racism as an aberration, a glitch, an accident, an isolated incident, a bad apple in the backwoods and outdated, rather than as innovative, systemic, diffuse, an attached incident, the entire orchard, in the ivory tower, in the tech industry, forward-looking, productive, in my field of sociology, we often say race is socially constructed, but we often fail to state the corollary that racism constructs. Secondly, I'd like us to think about the way that race and technology shape one another. Because again, more, more and more people are accustomed to thinking about the social and ethical impacts of technology, but that's only half of the story because social values, norms, structures all exist prior to any given tech development. So it's not simply the impacts, but the inputs to wh which we need to be concerned about, which leads to a third provocation, that imagination is a contested field of action, not an ephemeral afterthought that we have the luxury to dismiss or romanticize, but a resource, a battleground, an input and output of technology and social order. In fact, we should acknowledge that most people are forced to live inside someone else's imagination. And one of the things we have to come to grips with is how the nightmares that many people are forced to endure are the underside of elite fantasies about efficiency, profit, social control. Racism among other axes of domination helps to produce this fragmented imagination where we have misery for some, monopoly for others. This means that for those of us who want to construct a different social reality, one grounded in justice and joy, we can't only wrestle with critique the underside of this architecture, but we also have to wrestle with the deep uh, investments, the desire even that many people have for social domination. I just want someone I can push around. So that's the trailer for um, the conversation or the rest of the talk. I wanna turn now to some more specifics, beginning with a relatively new app called Citizen, which will send you real-time crime alerts based on a curated selection of 911 calls. It also offers a way for users to report, live stream and comment on reported crimes via the app. And it'll show you incidents as red dots on a map so you can avoid particular areas, which, is a slightly less racialized version of other apps called Ghetto Tracker and Sketch Factor, which use public data to help people avoid supposedly dangerous neighborhoods. Now, some of you are probably thinking, what could possibly go wrong with the, in the age of barbecue Beckys, calling the police on black people cooking, walking, breathing, bird watching out of place? It turns out that even a Stanford educated environmental scientists living in the Bay Area can be an ambassador of the carceral state calling the police on a cookout at Lake Merritt. It's worth noting too that the app Citizen was originally called the less chill name Vigilante. And in its rebranding, it also moved away from encouraging people to stop crime, but rather now simply to avoid it. As one member of the New York City Council put it, crime is now at historic lows in the city, but because residents are constantly being bombarded with push notifications of crime, they believe the city is going to hell in a handbasket. Not only is this categorically false, but it's distracting people from very real public safety issues like reckless driving and or rising opioid use that don't show up on the app. What's most important, I think, to our discussion is that citizen and other tech fixes for social problems aren't simply about technology's impact but also about how social norms and values shape what tools are imagined necessary in the first place. 
So this dynamic is what I take up in two new books. The first one examining the interplay between race automation and machine bias um, more broadly as an extension of older forms of racial domination. And the second is an edited volume on the carceral dimensions of technology across a wide range of social arenas. Um, if starting with policing and prisons to less obvious contexts like the retail industry, financial technologies, and the digital service economy. In terms of popular discourse, what got me started working on these projects was the proliferation of headlines and hot takes about so-called racist robots. There was a first wave of stories a few years ago that seemed to be shocked at the prospect that technology is not neutral. A second wave seemed less surprised. Well, of course, technology inherits its creator's biases. And now I think we've entered a phase of attempts to override or address the default settings of racist and sexist robots for better or worse. And one of the challenges we face is how to meaningfully differentiate technologies that are used to differentiate us. Take for example, a recent study, racial bias in a medical algorithm favors white patients over sick or black patients, reports Obermeyer and colleagues, in which the researchers are actually able to look inside the black box of algorithm design, which is typically not possible with proprietary systems. What's especially important to note is that the algorithm does not explicitly take note of race. That is to say, it is race neutral. By using costs to predict healthcare need, this digital triaging system unwittingly reproduces racial disparities because on average, black people incur fewer costs for a variety of reasons, including systemic racism. And in my review of the study by Obermeyer and colleagues, I argue that indifference to social reality on the part of tech designers and adopters can be even more harmful than malicious intent. In the case of this widely used healthcare algorithm affecting millions of people, more than double the number of black patients would have been enrolled in programs designed to help them stay out of the hospital had the predictions been based on need rather than cost. So race neutrality, it turns out, can be a deadly force. This combination of coded bias and imagined objectivity is what I've termed the new Jim Code. Innovation that enables social containment while appearing fairer than discriminatory practices of a previous era. What I'm drawing attention to with this concept is that technology can hide the ongoing nature of social domination and allow it to penetrate every facet of our lives under the guise of progress. This formulation, as I highlight here, is directly related to a number of other cousin concepts by Bulamwini, Brown, Noble, Broussard, Eubanks, and others. And so there's been a proliferation of wonderful work over the last three years that I've been in conversation with. And what I'm encouraging us to think about here is that anti-Blackness, um, how anti-Blackness gets encoded in and exercised through automated systems by offering four conceptual offspring to the new Jim Code that follow along a kind of spectrum from the most obvious types, engineered inequity, to the more insidious types, techno benevolence. And for the sake of time, I'm just gonna unpack the last two um, ideas. So coded exposure names the tension between ongoing surveillance of racialized people and calls for digital recognition and inclusion, the desire to literally be seen by technology and that little green light on top of our computer screens. What I'd like to underscore is that it's not only in the process of being out of sight as this image depicts, but also in the danger of being too centered that racialized groups are made vulnerable. So that being included is not simply positive recognition, but can be a form of unwanted exposure, but not without creative resistance, as I'll come back to in just a moment. But first, a, a short uh, video clip, two minutes, that illustrates one side of this, uh, this equation. That was a clip from Better Off Ted, which is now off the air, a little too subversive. And that episode is called Racial Sensitivity, in case you want to watch the whole thing online. And so the reason why I love it is that the show brilliantly depicts how a superficial corporate diversity ethos, the prioritization of efficiency over equity, and the default whiteness of tech development all work together to ensure 
that innovation literally produces containment. The fact that darker skin employees are unable to use the elevators, doors, water fountains, turn the lights on, that's all treated as a minor inconvenience in service to a greater good. But good for whom? We have to continuously ask. And the fact that they use the iconic water fountain in order to illustrate how innovation can produce containment is, was, was genius. Um, so finally, some of the most interesting developments, I think, are those we can think of as techno benevolence that aim to address bias in various ways. Take, for example, new AI techniques to vet job applicants. A company called HireVue aims to, quote, reduce unconscious bias and promote diversity in the workplace by using a program that analyzes recorded interviews of prospective employees. It uses thousands of data points, including verbal and nonverbal cues, like facial expression, posture, vocal tone. And then it compares job seeker scores to those of existing top performing employees to decide who to flag as a desirable hire and who to reject. Another value added according to HireVue is that there's a lot that a human interviewer misses that AI can keep track of to make quote, data-driven talent decisions. After all, the problem of employment discrimination is widespread and well-documented. So the logic goes, wouldn't this be even more reason to outsource decisions to AI? Well, consider that question in light of a study by a Princeton team of computer scientists, which looked at whether a popular algorithm trained on human writing online exhibited the same racially biased tendencies that psychologists have documented among humans. In particular, they found that the algorithm associated white sounding names with pleasant words and black sounding names with unpleasant ones, which builds on a classic audit study from about 2002 or three that uh, sent out old school resumes to thousands of employers in um, Boston and Chicago and found the same pattern of discrimination based on names because all of the other qualifications and experience on the resumes were comparable. So too with gender coded words and names as Amazon learned a few years ago when its own hiring algorithm was found discriminating against women. Nevertheless, it should be clear by now why technical fixes that claim to bypass human biases are so desirable. If only there was a way to slay centuries of racist and sexist demons with a social justice bot beyond desirable, more like magical. Magical for employers perhaps looking to streamline the grueling work of recruitment, but a curse for many job seekers. As this headline puts it, your next interview could be with a racist bot, bringing us back to that problem space we started with. Though it's worth noting that job seekers are already developing ways to subvert the system by trading answers to employers' tests and creating fake applications as informal audits of their own. In fact, there was one HR employee uh, from a major company that recommends that people slip the words Oxford or Cambridge into our CVs with invisible white text to pass the automated screening. In terms of a more collective response, a federation of European trade unions called UNI Global has developed a charter of digital rights for workers, touching on automated and AI-based decisions. In the US, the algorithmic accountability bill is one effort to create some protections around the ubiquity of automated decisions in our everyday lives. It's a start, but in no way sufficient in terms of transforming the regulatory ecosystem in which technology has free reign. Another development that keeps me somewhat hopeful is that tech workers themselves are increasingly speaking out against the most egregious forms of corporate collusion with state-sanctioned racism. For example, thousands of Google employees condemned the company's uh, collaboration on a Pentagon program that uses AI to make drone strikes more effective. And a growing number of Microsoft employees are opposed to the company's ICE contract, saying that, quote, as the people who build the technologies that Microsoft profits from, we refuse to be complicit. And if you want to dig more into this, I would encourage you to start with the hashtag tech won't build it for other examples of refusal. And as this article published by Science for the People reminds us, contrary to popular narratives, organizing among technical workers has a vibrant history, including engineers and technicians in the 60s and 70s who fought professionalism, reformism, and individualism to contribute to radical labor organizing. The current tech workers movement, which includes students across our many institutions, 
can draw from these past organizers' strategies and challenges in learning to navigate the contradictions and complexities of organizing in tech today. In terms of education, which I think of as the ground zero for planting a more historically and sociologically grounded approach to STEM, I'll just mention one concrete resource um, that's free to download called the Advancing Racial Literacy in, STEM, uh, in Tech Handbook, um, which was developed by some co wonderful colleagues at the Data and Society Research Institute in New York. The aim of this intervention is threefold to develop an intellectual understanding of how structural racism operates in algorithms, social media platforms, and technologies not yet developed, and emotional intelligence concerning how to resolve racially stressful situations within organizations, and a commitment to take action to reduce harms to communities of color. In that spirit, initiatives like Data for Black Lives and the Detroit Community Technology Project are just two of the many different tech justice organizations that exist all over the world. Uh, for example, Data for Black Lives brings together people working across a number of agencies and organizations in a proactive approach to tech justice, especially at the policy level. And the Detroit Community Tech Project develops and uses technology rooted in community needs, offering support to grassroots networks, doing data justice research and hosting what they call Disco Techs, which stands for Discovering Technology, which are these multimedia mobile neighborhood workshop fairs that can be adapted in other locales. Taken together, a growing movement of tech justice organizations is beginning to transform paranoia about surveillance into power, galvanizing communities to take a proactive approach to designing the world that we want to live in. And build, they, they together build on a long tradition of data justice scholars and journalists exemplified by W.E.B. Du Bois's um, modernist data visualizations um, and anti-lynching writer Ida B. Wells Barnett's expert deployment of statistics in the red record. These are the shoulders uh, that we all stand on today. Among these giants is the late legal and critical race scholar, Eric, Derek A. Bell, who encouraged a radical assessment of reality through creative methods and racial reversals, insisting that to see things as they really are, you must imagine them for what they might be which is why I'm convinced in any conversation on 2020 vision, I think the arts and humanities are so vital to any discussion or movement about transforming the default settings of technology and society. One of my favorite examples of what we might call a belly and racial reversal is this parody project that begins by subverting the anti-black logics embedded in new high-tech approaches to crime prevention Instead of using predictive policing techniques to forecast street crime, the white collar early warning system flips the script by creating a heat map that flags city blocks where financial crimes are likely to occur. The system not only brings the hidden but no less deadly crimes of capitalism into view, but it includes an app that alerts users when they've entered high risk areas to encourage quote, citizen policing and awareness. Taking it one step further, the development team is working on a facial recognition program to flag individuals who are likely perpetrators. And the training set used to design the algorithm includes the profile photos of 7,000 corporate executives downloaded from LinkedIn. Not surprisingly, the average face of a criminal is white and male. To be sure, creative exercises like this are only comical when we ignore that all of its features are drawn directly from actually existing proposals and practices in the real world, including the use of facial images to predict criminality. By deliberately and inventively upsetting the status quo in this ma manner, that is changing the narrative and the frame, analysts can better understand and expose the many forms of discrimination embedded in and enabled by technology. So here's my final proposition. If it is the case that inequity and injustice is woven into the very fabric of our society, we saw it in policing and preschool, we saw it in the history of science and the ongoing deployment of biomedical excuses for racial violence, et cetera, then that means each twist, coil, and code is a chance for us to weave new patterns, practices, and politics. 
the vastness of the problems that we're up against will be their undoing once we each accept that we are pattern makers. So if, as I suggested at the start, an ahistoric and asocial approach to science and technology captures and contains then a historically and socially grounded approach opens up possibilities and pathways. It creates new settings and codes new values and builds on critical intellectual traditions that have continually developed insights and strategies grounded in justice. And my hope is that we all find ways to build on this tradition. So thank you so much for your attention. I'm gonna stop sharing now and I welcome your questions and comments. Thank you so much. It took me a little while to get my video started, but uh, really appreciate it. And I've been tweeting up a storm and a lot of other people have while you've been speaking. So many, so many great insights and, uh, and even a better off TED episode to watch. So that, that's fantastic. Uh, we're getting some questions in the question and answer box and, and I, I would invite people to, to use that Q&A box to, to enter their own questions. And of course, I have a couple of my own. Uh, one is, uh, you know, at one time during the summer, we heard so much about the, the, uh, the impact of the George Floyd protests and the Breonna Taylor protests. And it seemed as if things were really getting traction. And, and, and I don't know what your perception is. I, I'd love to hear how, how you see things developing now. To me, it looks as if uh, a lot of people have moved on. It, it really isn't having much of an impact in the past, in the last couple of weeks of a presidential election. And so I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective on that and, and what needs to be done to keep that in the public eye. Yeah, that's, that's a, a thing I think a lot of us have been thinking about. And, and of course, um, I can't say with certainty um, how to account for the last six months in terms of, first of all, what I think of is as I was astonished to see how, um, how differently people reacted or how many more people, let's say, reacted to George Floyd's murder um, compared to the many, many other murders, almost daily, you know, assaults, whether captured on video or not. And so initially, and still a bit, I'm still struck by trying to figure out what, what is distinct about this particular instance of racial violence compared to others that led people to flood into the streets. Um, and not just in big cities, but in small towns and elite suburbs. Certainly the, the main streets in Princeton were, were overflowing. The, the student activists that organized the protest put little chalk marks really sweetly to try to maintain social distancing. And that had no effect because there were you know, so many more people that were shoulder to shoulder. And so you know, just thinking locally and looking globally at how many people I think the only kind of variable obviously is that this converged with the pandemic. So there's something about the, the context of the pandemic that I think created a, a, a recipe, let's say for this, this um, out flood, flood of uh, support. Now, your question is then what's happened since? And I, a friend of mine just tweeted a, either a, a statistic or survey results that indicated that among white Americans, their support for Black Lives Matter has plummeted dramatically from something like, uh, of those surveyed, something like 70% to 40% or some significant shift like that. And so, you know, there's a lot that could account for that, a lot that's not new. Um, you know, there's so many ways in which people are fighting for their lives and trying to draw attention to issues and when they're told that they're not doing it the right way, <laughs> you know, this is the way the, the way that you need to protest. This is the way that you need to survive. <laughs> um, then certainly it's that kind of micromanagement of protest that could also account for people saying, well, if you're not gonna do it the way that I would, then I can't support this. And so the, there's certainly a whole tradition um, along those lines of people, um, you know, taking issue with the way that people are trying to um, draw attention to the crises. But there's another possibility as well um, that I think we could do well, we would do well to think about and, and, and excavate. And that is that the, the public kind of stances, whether it's going in the street or make putting a statement on your website that your organization supports Black Lives Matter, as we saw many, many dozens do, 
perhaps, and this is my more hopeful, optimistic <laughs> uh, possibility, perhaps we're moving, we're, we were shifting from the symbolic gestures and the one-off protests to thinking about how to apply this in the day-to-day -day nitty gritty of our work and our lives, which is behind closed doors. It doesn't get all the attention. There's nothing to report here. <laughs> it's how do you change the, the things that we most take for granted? And if it is the case that people are becoming more introspective, both in terms of organizationally, in terms of their professions, in terms of their own lives, that means that the relative silence or the relative uh, you know, lack of buzz around it may be good news because we're moving from the things that people do to get attention or to get credit for standing up for the cause to the subtler everyday forms of social change and social transformation. And certainly in the way that I ended the talk, encouraging us to think about how to transform the everyday patterns of our work and lives, I would really hope that that would begin to account for why the big spectacles are sort of receding and people may be starting to think about how to do the, 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 the grunt work of anti-racism and social change. Uh, I, I know uh, I live in the Seattle area and, and so we did have uh, quite a brouhaha over the chop uh, and uh, the protests and, and Portland isn't all that far away that there have been nightly protests in Portland. And, and one of the things that I think is that uh, the, the issue has gotten more complex and you've got more players in it. You've got the Proud Boys, it's all getting mashed together. Uh, is mm -hmm. that, uh, you, you've kind of watched how these, these trends mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, racism and the response to racism goes, is that kind of the way things usually end up is that they get all mixed up and then nothing ends up being done? Well, um, you know, I think certainly at every stage of the long freedom struggle, things have been complex. And I think sometimes we, we tell history as if it was simpler, that the lines were less blurry, that there was less infighting and so on. Like the, the, our, our telling of it is a lot neater than it ever actually was. Um, but certainly in this moment, um, there are forces that are strategically trying to sow confusion and disinformation and conflict using the very technologies that I described. And so a new variable in the mix of the normal kind of complexity and conflict that exists in any movement and any moment of social change now has very powerful tools at its disposal. And the, and the main platforms up till right, right now are not doing their part in terms of preventing the flooding of our, our digital worlds and our digital stream with this kind of information that is, is designed and meant to break us. And I say break us, not simply break us individually, but literally to break society. That is this very thing that we take for granted as a unit of cohesion they have been on the record to say that they are using targeted advertisements, whether in the 2016 election using Cambridge Analytica's tools, et cetera. Steve Bannon has said, we need to break society so that we can recreate it in our own vision. And their own vision is more white supremacy, more class warfare, more patriarchy, more ableism and on and on. And so I think we should not um, underestimate that there are powerful actors working overtime with a lot of resources, a lot of influence that are not that are really intent on fracturing us even more than we are. We are fractured because they win. Um, and so I think this is a call to action for all of us moving beyond just our own professionals, taking off our own sort of disciplinary or professional hat to think about really what, what is our responsibility in a context in which the very unit of our togetherness, the nation, the society is under assault using technologies that are not neutral. And um, for those who want a little, little taste into what I'm uh, referring to here, if you haven't already seen it, I would encourage you to see, uh, watch the 
documentary called The Great Hack on Netflix, just to just to verify what I'm saying. <laughs> don't take, don't believe me. <laughs> Go do your own homework. And then once you do, ask yourself, um, what do we what do we have to do in this context in which uh, you know unity and justice are 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 seen as a threat. Wow, you are really adding to my streaming video list, which is good. I'm looking for something to watch, so I'll, I'll keep the great hack in, in mind. And, and I want to mention that tomorrow, one of the sessions that we'll be having is about uh, vitriol and disinformation and, and what science, science writers need to know uh, about true. that. And, and there's an hour-long documentary that uh, my colleagues at CASW have prepared on that. And so I want to make sure that the people watching here uh, take, uh, you know, add to their streaming video list watching that uh, mini documentary so that they're ready to ask questions tomorrow. And, and that, that's absolutely. Uh, and, and for anyone who really wants, and, and, and I encourage documentaries and, and videos, but also in terms of the intellectual foundations of really um, analyzing and critique, critiquing, empirically researching these disinformation campaigns, I would uh, encourage you to look up the work of Joan Donovan, J-O-A-N Donovan. She's at Harvard Kennedy School, and she's just come out with some great resources that I, that I think will be really useful to this community. Yeah, uh, we are getting some good questions and I, I invite uh, our audience to, to keep it, sending them in. I, I just had one other one because we are a group of science writers. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned for, during the talk is that more knowledge in the terms of data does not necessarily uh, lead to more support for change. And, and we see that in other issues as well. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, climate change, there have been a mm -hmm. lot of studies uh, pointing out that even though you've got a lot of data, uh, it, in, in fact, uh, as happens in the case of looking at racial issues, more data mm -hmm. tends to solidify the divisions. And, and so are there lessons that can be applied more broadly to those other scientific issues where we're facing a similar problem? You know, I don't know if there's one solution, but my overarching um, encouragement is really to, for us to become, and I don't need to tell you this community that, but in general, my own, you know, the, the circles that I'm in, I want us to take and become as rigorous about the narratives and the stories um, and really to think about what motivates people. Right, um, and so um, a few years ago, there was a great book of short stories called Love in the Anthropocene. And it was a set of short stories that basically was in a near future in which cli the climate crisis had advanced. Um, and then it, each story looked at different personal relationships, the relationship between a father and a daughter, the relationship between two lovers, et cetera. But the context was the, this climate collapse. And so it explored how this big macro shift is going to affect us at the, at the level of the relationships that we care most about. How, for example, say if you, for generations, one of the things your family has done is gone fishing <laughs> as a way to bond and, you know, but what if there's no place to fish? What kind of, you know, what, so thinking about how the intersection of the, the uh, external changes to our internal lives and our personal relationships and really hitting home at that level so that we can begin to care about the larger, you know, the larger forces. And so, you know, that's just one example and not to say that that book of short stories is gonna magically change people's perception, but it just struck me as an, a really powerful um, shift in how we start the conversation rather than dumping a bunch of data. <laughs> it's really saying, you know, you know that thing you care a lot about that was really meaningful to you? Let me show you how this is going to sh affect it, right? And so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a principle of organizing more broadly is that you always start with where people are at, right? And so there's a level of respect and mutuality that I think um, we apply, we I would hope we would apply, you know, to our relationships and organizing that apply also to how we tell stories, you know, in terms of starting where people are at. 
That's great. Well, we've got so many great questions. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we're going to almost have to do this as a lightning round because uh, <laughs> I don't know if we're going to get. All right. So uh, <laughs> we were talking about Portland. Uh, anonymous attendee writes in, as someone writing in from Portland, I would love to hear more from you about the ways that technology has allowed white supremacy to co-opt the protests here and spread their ideology. OK, why don't you keep going? And I'm making a, a mental note. OK. Uh, since AI is created by humans, do you think it can ever be bias free? Is that even the goal? Mm -hmm. Keep and going. this is kind of related. Do you foresee a real future where technologies are ever harm free or is the bias part of our condition? Mm -hmm. Similar. And uh, let's see, when covering stories about emerging technology in justice systems, schools and hiring, what can members of the media, particularly non-Black members of the media, do to ensure that they are seeing the possible racist implications of these technologies and systems? Hmm. OK, let me just try to reflect on those. Um, yeah, there's, sure. there's, some, there's some overlap, and they're all really, really important questions. And I think the Portland question applies to the way that white supremacists have been and are using the internet more broadly. Um, you know, the work of my colleague, Jesse Daniels, um, it, it really shows us that from the origins of the internet, white supremacists have been the first users, <laughs> you know? And so this phenomenon of them using these tools is, is not, an else, uh, not at all new. It was part of the birth of the internet that, you know, um, so that's one sort of retelling, I think that we have to recognize that they have been the, the, the first, many times the first users. She has a great short essay that um, describes this called Twitter and White Supremacy, a love story. <laughs> and so you can check that out for a really crisp um, uh, narrative. But one of the things now we have to reckon with is not simply that white supremacists are using the internet to enable forms of racial violence in Portland and elsewhere, but that the platforms actually are profiting from it. And so that's a different level of accountability is like, we would expect white supremacists to do whatever they can to sow harm and violence, right? That's their job description. The question for us becomes, um, how are we going to hold Facebook, Twitter, and other social media accountable for not simply not doing anything. That is, they're not just standing by and saying, free speech, free speech, do what you want. But with the clicks, with the circulation of this information, they are filling their pockets. They are filling their bank accounts. And so it's a deeper level of complicity that Mark Zuckerberg, that these other, um, you know, the, these moguls have when it comes to this. And so we know, for example, when it came to Kenosha in Wisconsin, the militias that showed up there, their activity on Facebook groups was well known. It was reported over 400 different instances of reporting to Facebook. And Facebook didn't act on its own policies not to enable this, right? And so they have policies in place that they don't act on that should require them to intervene, to take down groups, to take down posts, and they don't. And so in light of this, some colleagues and I over the last few weeks have formed what's called the Real Facebook Oversight Board. So Facebook has its own ethics board, but we've decided it's not working. And so we've created our own board. Um, it includes some of the, the, the whistleblowers and the journalists who broke the Cambridge Analytica story a few years ago, it includes ex uh, you know tech uh, high folks up in tech who are part of it now who um, you know are, are part of the, the 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 overview process and includes scholars and, and advocates a lot of major civil rights organizations and we've been meeting weekly um, in order to assess face Facebook Facebook's own inaction when it comes to this our next meeting is tomorrow um, uh, it'll li stream live. I believe it's at one o'clock. You can go to the real Facebook oversight boards, Twitter and get notified. But this is an example of people coming together to create real accountability and oversight. And what's so interesting is many of the things that the, the company has been sitting on over the last year, they've suddenly magically in light of the public uh, a spotlight and shame associated with this have suddenly acted on some of the, 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 the demands that we've placed on them. And so um, certainly white supremacy is among a suite of issues that 
the companies profit from, not simply enable. Um, and then again, the, this, this quest, the questions around bias and AI. Um, yeah, I don't think the goal is to aim for some magical idea of bias free, um, but it's to really think about what forms of bias are being built in and who, it, who benefits from it. And so it's kind of why I ended with the white collar early warning system, because that's not a bias free system, but what it's doing is it's shining a light on the people and the actors that typically remain invisible that wield a lot of power, that produce a lot of harm <laughs> yeah, for many people, but escape accountability. And so the question for us is how can we use technology? How can we use data? How can we use digital tools in order to shine a light and enhance the accountability um, of those who produce risk for the population? And so too often, the vast majority of our, our tools that we've been producing um, are about assessing the riskiness of marginalized groups, the riskiness of what, let's say people who are standing parole, the riskiness of someone who's trying to rent a, an apartment. Um, and so our digital tools are pointed downwards at the most vulnerable who are trying to navigate unjust systems, housing systems, medical systems, policing. What if we took those and turned them in the other direction and created something like that exists, the anti-eviction mapping project? rather than keeping track and surveilling individuals who are dealing with housing insecurity, it's keeping track of landlords and real estate developers and looking at their eviction rates, et cetera. There's another project that rather than looking at people who are standing trial is, is, is take collecting data on judges and looking at their records and looking at how they hold people unconstitutionally, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is a way of shifting the the lens shifting the attention where we are sort of pointing and it's not bias free it's cognizant of the power power dimensions um the power hi hierarchies in our society and it, it's strategically deciding we are going to build tools that empower the marginalized right that give us information that we want that we can use to mobilize whether it's mobilized for housing justice or health justice and so I think the quest for bias-free or neutral technology is another way to, um, to skirt responsibility for intervening and addressing in systems that are killing people. And then uh, returning to that question, uh, there are actually a couple of associated questions having to do with what we as members of the media, particularly non-Black members of the media, can do to make sure that we uh, are alerted to the possible racist implications of technologies and systems. And I think yeah. one of the things that um, has been mentioned in other contexts, you know, uh, whether you're covering COVID or, or uh, gene editing or whatever, is that that journalists should have like a peer review committee of, uh, of experts in the field that they're covering mm -hmm. that they can turn to. And maybe it's the same for uh, these issues that have uh, racial implications. Uh, yeah, so that's one yeah. question. Yeah, so I think that that's a question that all professions should or are beginning to ask. And I would suggest that in addition to thinking what the individuals already in that profession can do, such as create your peer review committee or some other kind of a sounding board for how to move forward, I would really encourage us to look at how uh, white supremacy has infected our own profession, right? In terms of who is behind the scenes, who is around the table. Um, and so in addition to creating new things, let's actually think about the whiteness of our newsrooms, right? And who who's actually creating the stories. And so um, I think that that's a first level that it really brings these questions home to roost. So it's not simply about what we report out there, but it's what we do behind the scenes, who, who is actually working in our profession. And that's not itself a magic wand. Similarly with tech, it's not enough in tech just to create a more diverse tech workforce. That's not gonna magically transform things, but it's really about um, you know, putting our, our actions and our policies professionally where our, our, our principles are and where our values are, like rather than trying to do things out in the world, also do things at home 
when it comes to our own profession. So that would include in hiring more Black, Indigenous, Latinx uh, journalists and people in the newsroom so that they can raise these issues on their own rather than a, a, a white newsroom that has to create a separate sounding board and remain white. I don't want to spill the beans, but uh, I'll just say that that's one of the coming attractions, I think, from CASW and NASW. So, so watch this space. Uh, a related question is whether you had any open access journals or other platforms that you would recommend that we watch for new research in this space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I mentioned in passing the Data and Society Research Institute, but they have a lot of resources on their website that you can turn to. On the resources page of my personal website, ruhabenjamin.com backslash resources, I have links to many, many other portals that you can access really great information for free. Um, and scholarly work and uh, social justice, tape data uh, justice work. And so resources page of my personal website, Data and Society Research Institute will get you started and send you, uh, give you a, a lot to work with. Uh, Genevieve Bjorn writes, I am reading Isabel Wilkerson's book, Case, which is on the bestseller lists all over the place. Will you comment on the social construct of CASED in terms, in the US, in terms of race and technological developments? Um, I probably can't do that in the minute remaining. It's such a, a good question and I know I'll be asked more and more because so many people are reading it. I will say that what I just heard uh, Isabel uh, speak about her work last week at, at a virtual event here at Princeton. And um, one of the interesting things, because I haven't read the book yet, that she like took pains to do was think about the differences and the relationship between the US racial caste system and the Indian caste system. And so in my own book, I do write very briefly about digital castes and the way that technology is actually producing, uh, reinforcing um, social hierarchies that are castes like. And certainly in the Indian context, they're one of the forerunners of this, but we see it all over the world, whether it's the Uyghurs in China or other socially subordinate um, groups in different, in different regions. And so invariably, the, the lesson is this, invariably um, the default setting of technologies is to reproduce the pi power hierarchies in different, in, in, in different societies. And so unless the people who are designing it are doing it in radically different conditions with different values, with different um, relationships with communities, we should, expect technologies to reproduce deepen harm, racial caste harm. And so I would encourage us not to feign surprise when we see evidence of that. And, and so think, oh my goodness, this technology is doing that. No, it's, it's gonna do that. <laughs> it's going to create deepening financial debt in different regions when you roll out an app, the cash app, and you, it, under the guise of, you know, opening up markets and so on. It's going to deepen health inequities. It's going to deepen surveillance networks. And so what if our starting point always is to expect that technology is going to be a tool of oppression and a tool of hierarchy unless proven otherwise. And let's get surprised when we find evidence of the other thing, <laughs> which is that it can actually be liberatory and actually aid you know, disenfranchised um, communities, et cetera. And so I think we have to shift our starting point and then demand better, demand more, not to resign ourselves to the techno status quo, but actually use our stories and put them in the hands of movements so that we can create a completely different ecosystem and set of expectations for those that are currently monopolizing our, not just our, our, our digital, infrastructures and tools, but are monopolizing our imagination of what's possible. Well, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, what we need to fix, but uh, I'd love to end this on a positive note. And, and I, I'm curious, what do you see out there that gives you the most hope for how things will de be developing? Well, you know, I'm a teacher first and foremost, and one of the real benefits is that I get to work with 18 to 21 year olds for the rest of my life who are really motivated to use their skills and their talents and their energy and service 
to social change. And so right now my biggest um, uh, sort of refuel place for refueling is the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab where I get to work with students who are partnering with communities to ask the questions that are most meaningful to communities and developing tools that will benefit them. And so this is a way of taking the resources and the intellectual sort of um, you know, energies of uh, my, the students at Princeton and partnering with um, community organizations all over the country in order to carry on the tradition of Ida B. Wells Barnett. Wow, this has been really fantastic. Thank you so much, Ruha. And uh, it's wonderful that this recording is session, uh, this, this session is being recorded. And uh, the only reason it won't be available immediately is because we want to caption it so that everybody can uh, get the wisdom from it. And uh, we also have remember uh, that uh, attendees can download uh, Raced After Technology for free, thanks to a donation from, from Wiley and sons uh, and uh, you can get more wisdom from that and uh, we're even going to try to archive the chat session because uh, people have been crowdsourcing like crazy in the chat window and uh, providing lots of links to to follow up on and and so i i, I just uh, this is one of the best <laughs> Petrosky lectures ever. And that's saying a lot because we've had Nobel Prize winners and, and uh, people who are at the top of their game. So Ruha, you've been at the top of your game too. And so thank you so much for, for It's for been being an honor, an honor and a pleasure. Thank